Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. That's right, we're getting back into R&D, baby. Mm, I'm so excited. Now that kits are shipping, I've been spending a lot more time working on feeders and getting them validated and ready to rock and roll. The plan is we're gonna take the current version of the feeders and use them in production and take a lot of notes. We're actually going to use them to make ring lights for a few weeks. And we'll see what's great about them, we'll see what's not so great about them. Then we're gonna use all that info and tune the hell out of them to make the next revision of the feeders. And that will ultimately be the version that we make available for sale. It'll be the result of all our validation and DFM and lifetime testing. But behind the scenes, over the past few months, a lot of work has gone into getting the communication between feeders and the motherboard and OpenPMP all working super smoothly. There's a ton of information to transfer and a lot of weird edge cases, and all of it needs to happen through OpenPMP and through Marlin. And the brainchild of this whole protocol is Justin. Hey, dude, how's it going? Hey, good, how about you? Good. <laughs> all right, Justin, who are you? What's your name? What, what's your jam? My name's Justin. I'm a software developer. I love dealing with 3D printers. My main job involves working with laser cutters uh, at Lightroom, which is super cool. I like machines that move. I like machines that do stuff. It's so much fun. And like every like centimeter you gain of traction, every little bit is just so rewarding. Uh, so what brought you to this project? Why did you have any interest in being a dev and participating in it? I wanted a pick and place machine, not because I developed thousands of boards, but because I like robots. A protocol is really simple, actually. It's just how you define the words you're gonna say and what you expect when. The thing with designing a protocol is you have a list of specific requirements that are just based on how the universe works, right? You can't bypass them if you do go accept your Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> yeah. There are things that we decide, like you should be able to move a theater from one slot to another. So you have these list of requirements. When you're architecting any design, any decision that can be made later is made later. But you're trying to make as few of those hard-coded decisions as possible and as allow most possible. of it to be dynamic and changeable as part of the protocol. Yep, exactly. Okay, so I have my scope hooked up here to RS-485 so we can actually see what the protocol is doing. The whole thing is very call and response. So it starts with the controller, the motherboard on the machine, sending a command out to a certain feeder, and then the feeder responds back with some information. And that's pretty much what happens for most of it. Based on what the command is, the feeder will respond with different information or respond back at a certain time, but it all fundamentally boils down to that. And just for an example, I'm gonna tell one feeder to feed and we're gonna see what happens. Okay, cool, so we got some data from that. It looks like two pretty significant blips of data, which is the first one, the controller telling the feeder to feed, and then the second one is the feeder calling back and saying, all right, I did it, it all went well. If we zoom in, we can actually see what the motherboard sent to the feeder to tell it to do that. And the numbers in the little green bar at the bottom is actually telling us what bytes are going across the bus. So we can find out what the motherboard is actually saying data-wise. This does kind of look like a bunch of gibberish, just like a bunch of numbers, but there is a logic to why these numbers are there. The protocol is structured in four segments. Every single bit of information that is sent back and forth from either the feeder or from the host has the same four segments in it. The first byte of data sent across is the address that you're trying to talk to. In this case, it's two, so it's trying to talk to the feeder in slot address two. The second bit of information sent across is the size of the payload. This is a byte that just represents how long the actual data we're trying to send is. In this case, it's zero D, which is this in binary. I couldn't tell you what it is off the top of my head. <laughs> and that's pretty much just saying, hey, this is the amount of information that I wanna tell you. Then comes the data, the actual information we're trying to convey. And then after all the data is sent over, there's two more bytes at the end. And these are what's called a CRC. A CRC is a way of checking to see if the data that went across the bus is actually valid. Was there a little error? Did one bit get sent incorrectly? I'll, I'll link in the description to a video that describes how this one works. It's really cool and it's pretty robust. And then the feeder responds back. If we look at the packet it sent back, it starts with 00, zero which is the address for the controller. The second byte is the length, which is saying, I'm gonna send two bytes of data. Then come those two bytes, the 02 and the 00, zero, and that's saying, hey, I fed correctly, it's all good. And then the last two are the CRC. Now that this whole thing is designed and like now we actually have it implemented in hardware, what are all the juicy things that it can do? What are all the like little features that are implemented in this? Yeah, so like obviously feeder's got a feed, right? But we can say, you know, I want you to move forward four millimeters. Great, thanks, have a good one, right? You click search and it goes through all the addresses one through 254. One, it says, is anything there? Timeout or response? Great, cool, next thing. Two, three, four, over and over and over again. And finally, you'll get a feeder pop up and it says, yes, I am in slot number three. How's it going? And it'll pop up and open PMP for you. 
the search function that Justin implemented in OpenPMP automatically asks every single address, is there a feeder here? And if so, it finds out which one it is. And it all happens in this beautiful little search button where it will just go through and it will probe all the different addresses. And sometimes it just gets nothing. And most of the time it does because we only have a couple of feeders on the machine right now. But sometimes it does get a hit back and there is a feeder in the slot and it'll respond with its data. And then OpenPMP knows that there's a feeder there and it knows which one. Super cool. We can go and tell the head, hey, this is the location that I want you to pick from. Go pick that piece up. If that moves, OpenPMP will scan for the hardware UUID of the feeder. When it responds with its new address location, it will say, oh, you moved to there. Completely seamlessly, instead of picking from one location, it'll go to the new location. You could take a feeder out, put it into a different location, and OpenPMP would try and talk to that feeder, but the feeder's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not there. You actually need to come get me over here. And it will just seamlessly figure that out and pick the part from the new location. Yeah, more or less. It'll tell the address, hey, I need you to do a thing. And it'll either get silence or another feeder that goes, hi, I'm new here. I haven't been initialized yet. And OpenPMP is like, oh, well, this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably the coolest aspect of this protocol is hot swapping. Because the feeders know what slot they're in, they can tell whether or not they've been moved in the middle of a job. The way the protocol is set up, OpenPMP will check to make sure that the feeder is in the slot it thinks it is. And if it's not, it rechecks the addresses to find where the feeder went. So in the middle of a job, we can just willy nilly swap feeders around, refill them, put in different ones, and OpenPMP will just go with the flow. It will see that those new feeders are in there and it'll just use those instead. So you can see in OpenPMP, I have feeders in slots two and three. If I swap them and then I rescan, they show right up as in three and two. And during a job, OpenPMP will automatically figure this out before it asks the feeder to move, which is so freaking cool. We have five pins, but this one wire here, it's our ID pin. It's directly connected to a one wire EEPROM. Feeder's connected. It starts trying to talk to the EEPROM over this one wire protocol. The EEPROM boots up. It says, yeah, what's your, what's your first byte? 37. Cool. That's my address. We also needed some way to be able to program the feeder floor, the little thing that the feeder slides onto, with what address it is. We use that little one wire EEPROM and there's no real way to program it aside from with the feeder. There's a little programming sequence where the feeder itself actually programs the feeder floor with its address, and you only ever have to do this once. Once the feeder floor knows what address it is and it's all lined up and in order, you never have to touch it again and they're ready to rock. They remember which one they are. Thank you so much for like all of the consideration that you put into figuring out how this is going to work and all the weird edge cases. It's awesome. It's, and it was so magical to just like see it work. It was so cool to like have it just go onto the rail and it just talked back to OpenPMP like no one's business. It was so cool. It's an open source project, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I, I definitely didn't do all of this. I didn't, I can't take credit for every idea. And the fact that all of these pieces just got glued together, normally the glue part is the part where everything just catches on fire. Yeah, but this was front loaded. You guys had the whole thing architected from the beginning and you plug them all together and it really did just kind of work. Cool. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you later. Catch you later. So with the output of all of the work Justin put into to making the protocol, getting it implemented into OpenPMP, and writing the specs so David could write all the feeder firmware, we now have a system to run multi-feeder jobs the proper way using OpenPMP all through Marlin. We can actually use feeders in a job now. And if something goes wrong, it'll tell OpenPMP, it'll let them know. We can swap feeders mid-job and it knows and keeps track of that. And now we're kicking off production with them. I'm gonna be running ring light jobs with these feeders for the next few weeks and learning a ton about the actual hardware and little things to tweak and tune about the protocol and a whole bunch of other things, things that I don't even know I need to be paying attention to yet. In my opinion, the best way to check UX is to take a pretty good crack at it just out of the gate and then test it in reality a lot. There are some things you just will not guess are good or bad until you're actually using it for what it's meant to be used for. It will take me using these feeders in production to find some things where it's like, oh, you know, that actually kind of stinks. I'd love for it to be this way. That kind of stuff, you can't just think of all of those necessarily out of the gate. You kind of need to just be shown it by using the thing. So we're gonna learn a ton using this. We're gonna learn a tremendous amount about why they're great, why they're not, different ways to tweak them and tune them. And then we're gonna have an awesome, awesome revision that comes out the other side. All right, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.
it's like a hungry hungry hippo except it's regurgitating tape as opposed to eating it i don't know it's a barfy barfy hippo it's a barfy barfy hippo (laughs) 